Hey good people, Sammy Ash here, Executive Director of the Ash Academy, and your host of our Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. Two things before we get started. First, our 2021 Spring Collection is now live in our store. Go to our website, theashacademy.org slash store to choose from hoodies, t-shirts, mugs, stickers, and so much more. Also, be sure to get your tickets for our upcoming second annual Mental and Physical Health Summit. We're bringing back our partners, the Kickback Specialists, for games and prizes throughout the event. Plus, we've got two panels again, our fitness and nutrition, plus our mental health awareness panels. It's the perfect time to do a check-in as things begin to open up a little bit more and we face a new normal. I'm sure I'm not the only one in needing to get back on track, so join us for that Tickets are $10 and directly impact our scholarship fund. I'll drop all these links in the description box. Can't forget to mention that we have sponsorship opportunities available. So if you are a small business or a corporate sponsor or anywhere in between, we would love to promote your business during our event. So I will drop the link for that as well so that you can see all the pricing for all the different ways that your business can be mentioned throughout the event. Now, let's get started with the show. All right. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Ash Academy's Inspire, Uplift, Engage podcast. I am Sammy Ash, and today we are joined by Lee Lantan who is a Hollywood vocal coach of Hollywood Vocal Studios. Thank you so much for joining us. I have to say, friend of the foundation, he was doing so much promotion for us for the Black <laughs> Entrepreneur Expo and Mixer. We appreciate you so much uh, for you know thinking of, of us and sending people our way. So, yeah. You know what? I think that's a, an important mission. You know, not uh, the Black Entre- Entrepreneur Expo, but just entrepreneurs, uh, I think, beyond um, just the racial aspect of it, I think that was inspiring a lot of people to see that I can do it too, you know? Absolutely. I don't, and so maybe um, the, uh, the the black racial portion of it was just there, but I'm telling you a lot of people are, when I was telling them about it, they were thinking like, you know what? My culture should be doing something like that too, supporting, supporting within our culture. That and of course- All about. Of course, across cultures too, so, you know. Absolutely. Um, that is amazing. So I want to give you an opportunity to give us some backstory, how you got into, we don't have to go straight to vocal coach. We can eventually get there, but how did you get yeah. into the arts? Like, so, where, where was that backstory? Well, you know, it was not something that, uh, any of the kids in my family really wanted to, to be in, but being mm. Asian, I, I don't know if you've ever seen this movie called the joy luck club. Um, it mm-hmm. was about these four Chinese ladies and they were reminiscing about their life and how hard their life was in China. Well, that's kind of the way it was, not that dra- dramatic, but my parents came from the Philippines and they were from farmers, you know, they, they grew up in the country and they were from farmers, they or little villages. So the dream of America was always grasp, you know, at their fingertips, but they they both became doctors. And when they came over to the United States, oh, wow. Yeah, when they yeah, you, there's a whole nother life that you don't even know about th- what they had to go through to get here. They thought, well, I want to give our kids what we could never get, and that was formal lessons. Because you know, back then it was like if you had formal lessons, you like you're like making it, you're keeping up with the Joneses, kind of. You're like you're you're you can afford lessons. That's a luxury. Mm-hmm. So, at five years old, each one of us, um, I'm the I'm the second um, kid out of four they said you're up and for the next 13 years I was with the same piano teacher Irene Winitsky of the UK- Ukrainian Institute of Music in Ohio in Cleveland and she prepared me well um, during high school I ended up going to a couple summer sessions at Berkeley um, in fact uh, the year that I went as a sophomore in high school I was the second youngest kid to ever attend Berkeley at that time my buddy that same summer became the youngest. So he edged me out by like three or three or four months, but, and we're still friends 40 years later. Right. Yeah. And so from there, it just sprung board into more and more music and then, uh, you know, college. And then I went to a great school 
in Los Angeles called the Grove School of Music, which was like Berkeley in, in Boston, but it was geared mainly to get you up to the speed of a Hollywood musician because all they're doing is giving you charts all day and you have to, you have to read them. Mm. And I'm telling you, it was the best formation of my life. And, and a lot of tours, a lot of acts came to our school looking for students who were, who could join their tour because, you know, at, there comes a point where you become a certain high level um, player and singer, you, you get that tour or, there's a lot of teachers that were already big. We had um, guys like Henry Mancini, who you've probably heard as a big time composer. Um, the composer of Rocky, he was there. Barry Manilow went to our school. And a lot of these other guys were on like the Arsenio Hall show, the, you know, the bands, mm -hmm. um, the Johnny Carson big band. And when they didn't do a gig, they would hand it off to their students to do, to do the gig so that they would you know, constantly get their resume bumped and the other pro players would lift their game. And so that's how I, that's how I got started. And that's where I started in uh, my formal vocal training was at that school. You know, so one of my teachers, uh, her name was Sue Rainey, was Grammy nominated four times <laughs> for voice. Awesome, awesome. Yeah. So you learn a lot along the way. So I, you did name drop a few uh, teachers and mentors along the way. How important were those people in your life for kind of steering you towards your career now? They, they were it. That, the, obviously, a lot of kids out there have the fire to do a garage band thing or they have these dreams, but these were the guys that were actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And so when I first entered that school, uh, you know, I was 19 years old. I was a young cat. There were, you know, I had, there were guys that were there that were all the way in their fifties and sixties that were continuing to study at this school. Mm. So they were really the ones that showed me a lot of these guys that were doing it out on tour. They always wanted to constantly give back. And that really inspired a lot of the students to always give back. So no matter what tour you're on, Sometimes somehow it became embedded that you're also a teacher. So if you hear somebody doing something that could be a little bit better, you want you want to gently guide them without overstepping your bounds, saying no, you should be doing it this way. You just say <laughs> no. You might want to you might want to check out this option. So awesome, awesome. I feel like you just started peeling back the layers on. Um, so this is the the Ash Art and STEM Academy, and okay. I separate it because. When people say STEAM, I believe, this is my own opinion, the arts get lost in there. So I, I want to make sure that we're highlighting the arts as not just a hobby, not just the starving artists. And, and you're kind of showcasing the fact that people have careers and they have ongoing education, just like people on the other side of sciences yeah. uh, in medicine, you have continued education there. Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering like, where, was it always an option for you to go into an arts field or was that a process to be like, okay, this no. is a viable option for me. I can have a career in this. So uh, it was <laughs> not always a viable option. Uh, okay. Having two parents that only gave them ch the choice of doctor or doctor, that's what their parents <laughs> gave them. Because, you know, in the Philippines, there's no financial aid, everything's paid cash. So you have to save mm -hmm. a lot of money in order to, to be able to do that. And so when my dad was growing up, he really wanted to be a lawyer because he's got that flair and his brother was in Hollywood already while he was in the Philippines, taking on all these little acting jobs like um, Operation Petticoat. He was on the Brady Bunch. He played the mayor on Brady Bunch. He played all these different things. And that was kind of a breakaway you know, because mm -hmm. he was helping support the family by sending money back to the Philippines. Mm -hmm. But um, me growing up, since both my parents are doctors, it was assumed that we would all follow in the sciences. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously they said, oh no, you can be free to do whatever you want. That's really not the case. It's do what Sweet. I want. <laughs> yeah. The yeah, there's those are the air quotes. But when I really told them that I want to give this a shot, you know, they, they bucked a little bit. They said, well, okay, we're going to do it. And the reason I got that was because I said, look, you gave me lessons starting when I was five. And so I really kind of blame you for my love for the arts. And they were just like, oh boy, this kid spun it. 
<laughs> and so they let me that they let me go back into that area, right? Mm. Um, but I, I tell you that I, I'm also my degree is in biochemistry. Beautiful. So. We we love to see a nonlinear. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I'm, tell us about that. Come on, let's segue. Let's uh, so why okay. did you... <laughs> so biochemistry, what, quite a degree <laughs> yeah, path yeah. too. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it was it was uh it was I got it from Ohio State. So when I left the Grove School of Music, you know, I was touring with a local band called Masquerade Six, who was pretty hot in the in the late 1980s. Um, we did shows with Janet Jackson. Uh, we were, I think we were being produced by Andre Simone. Some of those tracks, I don't know if you know Andre Simone, he did Jody Watley. I think he's married to Jody Watley. Mm. And um, Howard Hewitt would come to our shows. I think Howard Hewitt wanted to manage us at one point. But, you know, that, that kind of uh, faded a little bit. But then because of my school, I was able to go out and play some shows with like Chick Corea, um, Jermaine Stewart, George Michael. I've had several shows with, you know, or more than several shows at uh, the Hollywood Bowl and, you know, other spots. But that was, that's what you were trained for. You were trained to be the hired gun, the assassin. You're not good. You're not in their band. You're just there to add more depth to their band. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. you, sometimes you see all these bands that have like only three, you know, three instruments and one singer and you wonder how do they get such a full sound? Well, there could be a guy playing a keyboard off to the side somewhere to really fill it up. Or, you know, yeah, these days it's not uncommon for them to be playing to, to um, a track, an actual backing track. backing track, just because you know what? These artists really want to give the most powerful and energetic show you know that they can and sometimes you just can't fit enough people on that stage or you, you or your tour can't support another player because maybe you're just up and coming so they'll they'll play that background track you know mm -hmm. and and really and really fill it up so that's how i got my got my start oh that's not how i got my start in biochemistry when when those <laughs> tours were over i went back to cleveland to, because i needed to figure out my next move the george michael thing was done and I really needed to figure out, is my tour done? Is that it? Because usually I would get a, a call to do something, but there were so many people graduating from my school and other schools that were taking these tours and those tours were already out and about. Mm -hmm. I started thinking maybe I'll just go out on the road with maybe a, a Broadway show or something like that. But I ended up going home to Cleveland to hang my hat with my mom and dad. And then uh, I started running a nightclub over there. So that's... Come on, Lee, with the past lives, <laughs> layer after layer of past lives. I know. It's, it's just like, oh, my gosh. It, it, it went from, like, the touring party over to this, the next party. And so for, like, the next 10 years, I was running nightclubs. But the, the and funny thing about that was is that uh, our entertainment director of this nightclub, which was called the Cleveland Beach Club, and it was, um, it was awesome, is that they had karaoke there in the, in the late 80s. So me and my brother were just, you know, screwing around. Everybody knew that, you know, we could sing and we were musicians because my hair was like down to here and his was, you know, even longer. And uh, I, I was singing like uh, a James Ingram tune, like just once or something like that, just to screw around. Mm -hmm. And the A&R director for Lavert happened to be there. So, and his name was Red. And so he asked us to like come to the studio because we had a unique look and uh, we ended up doing a demo. And before you knew it, we were signed to their production company, Travel Productions, which was underneath Atlantic Records. Um, it was uh, there we met, obviously, the OJs, obviously, mm -hmm. Leverts, But then they had other guys like the Rude Boys, uh, Men at Large, uh, you know, really good, soulful R&B cats that were just... Uh, uh, Cleveland is known for a lot of R&B. There's so many uh, national acts that come out of Cleveland. It was incredible. It was a little bit different than um, what me and my brother were into. We were into like heavy metal. Mm -hmm. And, but my training at Grove was, he told me I have to play like seven different styles and I better kill it because you never know which style is going to pick you up. Mm -hmm. So here I'm thinking I'm going to get signed by like a hard rock label and sing for like Van Halen someday. And then all of a sudden we shift gears and now we, now we're more into R and B. <laughs> so, 
you know, but I, but by that time I, you know, I was really into like a lot, a lot of guys like Alexander O'Neill, Luther Vandross, obviously Stevie Wonder and stuff like that. And we, and for the next um, four years, I think it was, uh, we were with Levert. Um, we were, they started doing our music, um, but our, the bass player for Levert, who was our producer, um, if, if I'm remembering correctly, we were gonna, we were already scheduled to be in the hit factory in New York. And um, we were supposed to be in the hit factory in New York, but he went off to be Luther Vandross's, sorry, he went to, off to be Luther Vandross's uh, musical director because mm. um, Luther Vandross's musical director was uh, Marcus Miller. He, Marcus Miller decided to be the musical director for, I think, the Arsenio Hall show. And mm. so when he, when he went off to do that, um, our deal was pretty much done. And so we just, the deal just faded. And that's when I decided I can't be running nightclubs for the rest of my life. Let me go into get a biochemistry degree while running nightclubs. Okay, we have to pause. Okay. <laughs> that is not like a natural progression. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. If I was all over, so, to get no. But I'm, I mean, okay. So I'm gonna go back to school. Love it. Uh, it's never too late. Go back to school. Yeah. But that degree, why was that? Why wasn't music the degree that you decided to go into? What was it about biochemistry? Well, because somebody's know, out there who has just as many years in at this point in your life. That at that point. Is like okay. I love music, but I might want to study something else, and I will yeah. go into that. So, yeah. what what was your thought process? I just want to know, so because somebody else might be out there feeling yeah. the same way. <laughs> so, you know, my parents were always the ones that were telling me, you know, okay, Lee, you did these great things and stuff like that, but can you do it for the rest of your life? And as I was thinking, uh, you know, about that, the answer obviously was going to be yes, but you could be also be a popper for the rest of your life, waiting for that next tour. Mm. So. I figured I'll, I'll go get my uh, degree in biochemistry because I must have uh, some sort of aptitude for the sciences because both my parents are, are physicians and they're like top in, top in their field, right? Well, it wasn't really like that, you know, it was, uh, I did my best, you know, I, I probably could have went to medical school, but it was not in my heart to, you know, do all of that. Mm -hmm. uh, but I did... Um, become a music minor over there. And the funny thing about um, becoming a music minor at Ohio State for especially for jazz, is that the books that they were using were from my old school, Grove. Oh, wow. And their advanced level of harmony was only mid level to where I already completed. So a lot of so a lot of the stuff that wow. those students were going through, I taught at my old school. So, That's you crazy. know, yeah, it is it is really it is really nuts. And so I ended up graduating from there and thought, I'll get a medical sales job, uh, but I'll go back to California because uh, there's probably more medical sales jobs out there. And yeah, I went into medical sales. I, I was in medical sales for like a long time while, you know, um, having my studio. So balancing two careers, but it became, well, uh, in order for me to get to that level of uh, studio, I just wanted to dip my chops you know, back into study because, you know, a teacher is always studying with somebody. Mm -hmm. And I figured there were so many great teachers out here. Let me, let me absorb them. Let them be my mentors. And, um, I, you know, you absorb what you can from them and you, you internalize it and you spit it back out to your students, right? Through your experience and stuff. And that's how I ended up with the Goodrich Vocal Studio in Studio City, who happened to be one of the top studios for Seth Riggs. And if you don't know anything about Seth Riggs, he has, he developed a system called speech level singing, which um, is the number one commercial vocal technique in, ever. He has over 130 Grammy winners that have studied with him oh, wow. and including 35 years with Michael Jackson. In fact, before the Thriller tour, uh, he's, uh, and he was introduced by Michael Jackson through Stevie Wonder and Luther Vandross, but then he's had, you know, hundreds other hundreds of others. Mm -hmm. I uh, eventually became the education advisor to all the students in Southern California to make sure that they understood the technique and had their education underneath their belts in order to move up. You know, to the you know to the uh, advancing levels. And so, amazing. 
Yeah, but you know, you're always keeping busy, right? Absolutely. I mean, I'm feeling the same way. You're like managing two careers. I was like, yes, I have a day job and I have the Ash Academy. And that's how it has to yeah. be. Yeah. Um, so what was it about voice that was like your thing to, to coach? Like, because there's a lot of different things you could have gone into within yeah. music. Like there's so this is why we separate the arts from STEM because there's so many things under that umbrella. Um, but like if you take music out of that too, there's so many different things and courses of study that you could be in. Like, what was it about that that was like, okay, this is my thing? Well, I decided that it was going to be my thing because, uh, you know, with my first band in Los Angeles, Mass Grade Six, we were signed to um, Island before it was Island Def Jam. Uh, mm -hmm. and then, then that went away. And then me and my brother were hooked up, uh, you know, at, with Atlantic Records through Levert and, you know, signed on our vocals and stuff like that. And so, plus I had all that training over at Grove from my, my one teacher, you know, vocal teacher had was nominated for, for four Grammys, but combined my teachers, just when I was adding it up the other day, they were nominated for 19 Grammys total, um, two, and they won four Grammys, two Emmys, and I think two Tonys. And so, and it was all geared towards music, and but my concentration was more voice, primarily because I didn't want to, um, I didn't want to be a keyboard player anymore <laughs> and haul all your equipment and make sure everything was there. Plus everybody wanted to be a lead singer and the, and the voice is probably the most difficult thing that you could study because you can't see your instrument. Right. And if you're having a bad day, something that you've eaten or something that you've drank could be giving you a bad day. You know, if you, if you're going to be a pro, you need to be able to need to fix it right then and there. And so that's, that's where my training came in. And when I first started taking vocal lessons at Grove and with uh, Seth and his crew, it was, I would get slapped around pretty, pretty hard by my teachers, but not, but not by um, Seth or, or, or his crew. It would be just like, no, you're, you're kind of doing it okay and you're hitting the note but you're not hitting the colors you know and you have to explore every color in your voice to make sure that it's applicable because you have you're a, a storyteller and you're the face of this band right and so if people are bored with you after 30 seconds they tune out and you'll know it really quick and your confidence goes way down so you have to find those details and since i was taught those details i wanted to help other singers become master storytellers is I got a lot of singers out there that technically they smoke, they crush it. They crush all these different songs by all these different people. But then when they bring me their songs, it's fairly boring mm. because they they don't know how to story tell their own songs. Mm -hmm. And so that's when you have to break that, break it down line by line. And where's the emotion? Where are you trying to take this thing? What are you trying to, to, get um, the audience uh, to feel because sometimes they're not singing their song, but being the artist, it's your job to make the audience feel what the writer was feeling. Not, not what you're feeling. You have to make that, you have to transpose that from author to them. And you're just the actor with music. Kind of a lot to absorb, beautiful. Sammy. <laughs> yeah, no, that's beautiful because I am a songwriter and a sometimes singer, but we will not talk about that. That's oh. what we're here about. But I will say that is super important. And I feel like everything boils down to either communication or storytelling, which it does be like a mode of communication. Yeah. Um, so what would you say within your um, coaching would be the most challenging part of it? Well... I would have to say that it depends on what level of singer you are. And a lot of people were always telling me, asking me like, do you really, you know, who do you really like working with the most? It must be all these pros that, that come in. Well, yeah, I do. I, I do enjoy working with a lot of the, these pros, but they're pros already. You know, they're coming in because they're trying to fix something that maybe has gone wrong with their voice on tour. And a lot of things can go wrong with their voice. Yeah. Or there could be um, somebody new that's just getting signed, but they want to go out on tour, but you know, their voice isn't ready to support a tour. 
And there's a big difference between singing one song in a studio or a, or a whole CD of songs and putting it out and giving it to your friends, but then be able to sing those 12 or 15 or 20 songs per night, four nights per week for a year. Can't do it. You know, yeah. a lot, most people will, will fall, but the people that I love helping the most are these pure beginners. And then maybe they're not even beginners, but maybe they don't have the same type of talent that uh, some of these other singers that come in and they just want to sing better, like in front of their family. And while I'm talking, like I've had CEOs and presidents of companies and they, they were in charge of 15,000 people. Uh, they're making probably three or $400,000, you know, and they have a very, very important job. And they all tell me something similar. If I could just sing on a regular basis, I would, I would just, quit my job and, you know, start a band and do it. But then of course I say, don't slow your roll. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> but they, they would say that, that everyone would be... needs a voice of reason, Lee. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. come on. Uh, but, but, <laughs> you know, they, but they, what they would certainly do is they would join a weekend band and mm -hmm. the, the fear that people have with their voice just to their friends or family is just so great and overwhelming sometimes that they can't step off that cliff. And as the saying goes, sometimes you have to step off that cliff and build your wings on the way down. Uh, you know, Lee, you just bought yourself a, a designation as pastor. <laughs> build, build those wings on the way down. I appreciate that. Um, so on the flip side, what would you say is the most rewarding part of so like uh, all the things that go into it that are difficult, like what is it like somebody that comes out after maybe being on the beginning side of things and they're like, okay, they, they're at a good middle yeah. ground. You're not going to say they're excellent now, but like they, they've reached their middle ground. You're like, okay, they understand they yeah. can go up from here, but I, I actually had an impact or what, what else would, what would be re rewarding for you? Sometimes these singers will get so much confidence that, they they won't come back and i and i like that you know it's not, it's not bad for business lee it is but never, you know but, never come back. <laughs> but if they if they don't come back because i know that they're now with a band and they're singing regularly at a karaoke karaoke show or whatever then that's my business card mm, you know i don't okay. i don't you know and and i i have a lot of business i don't i don't really need their business I want their business, but you know, that's such a proud thing once they get to that level, you know, mm -hmm. um, in our studio, especially with me, there's been quite a few times that I would have these singers coming in and they would just smoke these songs. They would, they would just kill it, but then they would only kill it in front of me. And then there will come a point where I know that the, their whole week is riding on what I'm about to tell them how their performance was of they practice. I know they practice and they could be a doctor. They could be whatever, you know, but they're, mm -hmm. but it's like, that's a, that's a lot of pressure to tell, you know, for me to tell them, yeah, you just crushed it or you weren't quite perfect, which is the general way of saying, go back and practice, you know? <laughs> um, but the proud is uh, of, to be very proud of these guys. Uh, sometimes they can't use that studio as always their leaning point or their, their crutch. Mm -hmm. So there have been a number of times where I, you know, where if they don't want to sing in front of their family or at a karaoke bar or something like that, then I don't let them back in. Huh. That's it. Okay. You know, and I said, you can't come back in until you tell me, honestly, if you sing at a karaoke bar this week, because you're not stepping back in here. And they were like, why, why, you know, and I go, well, you know what, there's some lessons can't be learned that they must be lived. And, you know, you've been training for X amount of months or years or whatever. I know that you have it, what it takes for me here to, to pull something off. How would you do it in a cast of 600 eyes looking at you? And so that technique is either in you or you fail. You tell me what's going to happen. And so then they end up doing it. And, and before you know it, they're always doing it. And that, and if they could do that, 
what other thing in their life could they do? That's amazing. It's, and, it's, and it's fun. <laughs> I mean, Lee, I already said when I met you, I was like, I might need to tap you for some lessons. Or Ta- yeah, please, yeah. brother. So, you're my brother. I, I'm, yeah, it's probably going to happen because <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I need it. I need it. Um, so moving on from that, I always ask our guests this lovely question. I'm smiling because I know some terrible advice I've received, but what is some terrible or the worst advice you have received? So there was this when prior to me going to music school, um, right after high school, you know, I took like a year off to work at, I think, Sam's Club or the Wholesale Club or something like that. And there was this one singer in in uh, that also worked at this club. And I went to go see his band a couple of times and he sounded like, oh, he could sing it all. AC, DC, you name it, uh, sky high. And he was just like an amazing singer. His thing was, I drink a lot of whiskey and smoke a lot of unfiltered cigarettes. Do it. You know, it's going to improve your voice. I'll tell you what I did, you know, and I had that, Gutterly rasp, <laughs> you know, Joe Cocker thing going on with, with oh my, 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 but my intent was to be like Steve Perry. Um, <laughs> and that was the worst advice that I ever, ever got. <laughs> Aren't those along the lines of things not to do to your, <laughs> your so, instrument? You're, do not you're, smoke, do not drink. <laughs> you're supposed to be, but I was 18, you know, I'm thinking like, oh, you've got the secret because you sound just like this guy in the, on this tape that I have in my car that my friend made for me on his cassette recorder. You know? Oh my gosh. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. What are some other things that you would say like protecting your instrument just because you are the expert? Like food, you kind of mentioned earlier like certain foods will probably mess with you or could right. mess with you. Yeah, so, um, that, yeah. so that depends on the person. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, could they have any sort of allergies? Before singing, um, if I know that I'm going to be singing within like two hours or one hour, I'm not going to eat. That's mm, it. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, when as soon as you eat something, um, and if it, especially if it's somewhat heavy, then all that blood is going to start rushing to your stomach as your stomach digests its food, right? It's got a, it's, the blood's going to pull those nutrients. So if all that blood is here, you know, trying to gather up those nutrients, that means you're going to also be needing water to process those nutrients. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, a lot of people, when they they eat, they end up falling asleep. So if all that blood is going and it needs to be processing these nutrients and stuff like that, then you might not be able to warm up well enough because all that blood is going towards your stomach and not really concentrating, you know, on your vocal cords, like flowing for your vocal cords. But of course, that being said, and in order to get the best flow of blood into your vocal cords, you have to do a couple things. Number one, drink a lot of water. Okay. Okay. So there's a reason why you wake up in the morning and you could speak like an octave lower and sing in an octave lower. It's because that blood is so thick because it has less water because you just urinated it all out. And once it's in your bladder, it, it, you cannot rehydrate once it's in your once when it's it's in your bladder. So it's especially thick. So when you start drinking that water, it'll probably take like forty five minutes to an hour for your body to absorb it, and it makes your blood less viscous. You know, not sticky. It, it'll flow, and that means it, you'll be able to hit the, all those capillaries in your vocal cords as you start warming up. And that leads me to number two is warm up. Don't depend on a song, you know, a song choices to warm you up and say like, okay, by my fourth song, I'm going to be totally warm. Spend some time doing some exercises in your cars to warm up on the way to the gig, you know, really stretch it out. And then before you know it, you're going to be feeling pretty prime. And, you know, uh, Amazing. during that, during that performance. Yeah. But you, you know, but it's a balance. So if I eat something, you know, I, I have to be aware of um, people say, oh, well, when I drink milk, it, you know, there's mucus. Well, it's not exactly mucus. It's the enzymes in your, your saliva that's breaking down the, the milk and it just happens to be thicker. That's just what it does. It's breaking mm-hmm. it down. Um, so you have to be aware. Does that, does that affect you? Yeah. Sometimes it affects me. So I'm not going to drink milk, you know, like right, you know, right before I go on stage, but I will have, you know, but since I drink like lots of milk all the time, you know, I, I know what it's, it's going to do to my body and that's pretty much nothing. Um, so I'll drink it like an hour before, but not, not like 10 minutes before, because, 
<laughs> you know, I'll have that I, milk residue. In. I was like, I don't know if I would want to do that. I'm also plant based, so uh, yeah. I don't know of any milk that I would want to go chugging, regardless of <laughs> dairy or otherwise. I'll right take before. it all. Give it to me all. <laughs> <laughs> now, so on the, another flip side for you, what is some of the best advice you've received? I, I'm sure you've gotten to where you are because someone has said something positive to you and you're like okay yeah. this works out <laughs> yeah of whiskey so, and cigarettes <laughs> yeah whiskey and cigarettes was not good uh, although i still drink whiskey and rarely <laughs> really do i smoke a cigarette once in a while you might get a craving but it's not going to kill you but don't make it a habit of like a pack a day right or if you're going to smoke go for the like the lightest cigarette in the world like carlton's which is like one carlton equals no eight carlton's equals like one marlboro light you know so oh go yeah, why are you even smoking at that point? Just to have something in your hand and smelling a little burnt leaf or something going on. Um, but the best advice that I got was at my school, the Grove School of Music, because every day that every day they treated you like a professional, even though your musicianship might not be at that level, they treated you at that level so you could be prepared what to expect out there in the real world. And that was always be prepared. Do your homework before you go to that gig, right? And being a singer... Uh, if you ever listen to some singers, you're thinking like, oh, well, that was pretty good. Well, the elite singers are not in it to be pretty good. They better be pretty on all the time. And so by preparation, they, you know, like in the studio or on that tour, we'll use in the studio for an example, they might have like, you know, you, we, were, we would be told, how are you going to hit that phrase? You know, most people just wing it. You know, at our studio and the way we were taught, you know, um, it, you know, at my school and through my teachers, well, it's just like, you're a storyteller. You could be hitting every different color, but then it might just sound like a bunch of slop. So how, how are you going to tell this story phrase by phrase? Are you going to go into your head voice with a very light falsetto? Or are you going to be heavy up there and have a chest quality up in your head voice? Or are you going to totally belt it? What are you going to be doing? You know, and how are you, you know, and if you're having trouble with this note to that note, what, how are you going to get, you know, from there to there? And they would give you the exercise. Then you would literally have to map it out on a, on a lyric sheet on what you're going to be doing or point out the areas that um, are giving you difficulty or, and, and putting a check mark after the phrase where you could actually take a breath because you don't want to take a breath in like, if you're singing like happy per day, you know, you don't want to, that's, that's not good, right? You want to, you want to complete the phrase on one breath if you can. So you come in extra prepared. And then when you finally um, are in the studio and you smoke, you know, that, that session, the way you prepared for it, throw it out the window because your producer's probably going to tell you he wants it another way, but you're so, so, so prepared with all those different colors Mm -hmm. and timings and you know dynamics stuff like that that you could do do it on command awesome uh, you know hope i hope i didn't ramble there <laughs> no i can't i'm just preparing myself for when i finally email you like i am ready for my <laughs> session when are you available um <laughs> so, okay so aside from all that you do to impact all of these singers lives and any of these musicians you're working with and all of these executives that you're helping be more confident or figure out a, a way to exit their field so that they become a singer um, yeah. <laughs> before your advice of yeah. Don't don't leave the don't yeah. don't don't do that. Yeah, slow <laughs> or your roll, maybe, slow or your maybe roll. not. Maybe yeah. that shouldn't be the the path. Um, what brings you joy? That's not related strictly to like everything rewarding about your job. Oh, so if it was something outside of music, um, I'm really a huge advocate for the homeless and reconnecting homeless with their with their people. Um, I mean. There's a lot. There's a lot of people that you're always suspicious of. Like, if I give them money, I, you know, are they really homeless? Like, especially in Los Angeles, there's there's a lot, like a lot of gypsies out there, and I, you know, especially like in Valencia area, you go to these places, you you see some, uh, you know, some family members that are young in their 20s and 30s, but they're out there in like the 100 degree heat and. And, uh, you know, they're holding up signs and they're carrying a baby, but then there's a newscast on them showing them that they're actually getting into like 
a, a Mercedes, you know, down the block because oh that's gosh. like their job. Yeah, it was very surprising. But then you have others that you know really could use a hand or two. Mm-hmm. So at my old studio, the Goodrich Vocal Studio, my teachers, Michael and Jennifer Goodrich, who are top in their field in Los Angeles, um, I credit them as being my main mentors over there underneath Seth. There was a homeless person who was sleeping, you know, just beyond the brick wall of the parking lot. And, you know, it wasn't too far. And he was camped back there. And that's where he would stash his stuff with like a couple other homeless people. And one day I was in Carl's Jr. And I know he goes into Carl's Jr. every Sunday or whenever. Mm-hmm. And I said, hey, man, tell me your story. Let's eat. You know, and, we, and then we had this dialogue every single, I would see him all the time. But every Sunday before I would teach, I would make sure that we went to breakfast together because he would be, he would be there. And uh, he was telling me his whole story. I, en- I ended up uh, going on this detective search on the internet to try to find his family. And I did. Yeah. And I, and they, and they ended up reconnecting after 10 years. And in fact, when I sent off the letter, this is like early two thousands, by the way, like 2003, 2004, when, when I wrote the letter to the brother who I just found on like, I don't know, one of the neckdetective.com or one of those pay sites that you get, mm-hmm. I wrote him letters and I, and I put in a picture of there and saying, Hey man, is this your brother? Because you know, I, I I knew his name, but in like whitepages.com, it only gave me the initials. So I was hoping that, you know, that it was him. Yeah. And I got a phone call back like three days later saying from, but not from the guy that I wrote, but one of his friends saying, Hey man, we want to know what your story is. You know, this just came out of the blue and blah, blah, blah. I go, well, I mean, this guy lives behind my, my studio here. That's it. And then the brother ends up calling me later on that day. And he explained the whole story saying that, um, they've been searching for their brother, Larry, for um, 10 years. From, you know, he wow. lived in Louisiana and he's from Louisiana, but he was also uh, an undercover police officer, detective for, I think, the Houston PD. And, um, but he went so deep undercover that he had uh, his mind snapped, a nervous breakdown, you know, and then one day he just left. Uh, and they couldn't find it for 10 years. But the crazy thing about it was that I sent off that letter at in um, the end of June, I think it was 2004. And their, their mom, Larry's mom, had just passed away in April. And the brother, Gary, who I was in contact with, who I wrote just blindly, said that on her deathbed, he said that he would find his brother. And then that letter arrived six weeks later. Y'all are not going to get me crying on this show. We're, <laughs> we're not doing this today. That's beautiful, though, for, for you to, like, where, where did that come from for you to even, like, reach out to someone um, well, and be like, hey, I just, I just want to talk to you and kind of I mean, humanize someone that people would yeah. either ignore or avoid, if you, if you will? Well, you know, it, it could be flashbacks of maybe when I was more arrogant and just brushed somebody off. Right. Mm -hmm. Or, and we all do that. And a lot of the homeless people, uh, they're, they're ashamed of being homeless because they don't know how they got into this circumstance. Um, Unfortunately, well, fortunately, Larry knew how he got into that circumstance, uh, but because he's, you know, became schizophrenic and, you know, uh, you know, all of that stuff. So, you know, there, there, there was that, but they're not invisible right? And they want to be invisible. And all of their people could be looking for them for years and never, where are you? We want to see you. It's never going to be as bad as you put it in your, in your mind. Right. And so I was thinking, well, there's got to be a, there's got to be a better way to connect these people. And so as just this year, as I was looking for a better way for people to connect, I saw this, I saw this article on this new app that's out there called miracle messages have you ever heard of it Mm -hmm. so i haven't used it yet but for miracle messages it's you you know you speak with homeless and then you get certain information with them 
uh, like where are they from and who, you know, try to get as much information from them as possible. And then you take a video of them saying, hey, do you want to, if, if I find your people, do you want to say hello to them? You know, say hi, say, we'll, we'll record a video. And if I should find them, you know, I'll send you, I'll send them your video. And then you would find, they would say like, hey, mom, just want to let you know that I'm doing okay. I haven't seen you in like 10 years and dot, dot, dot. And then there's volunteers that will go off the information that they gave them and they will search and search until they find their, their people. And I think they have like just underneath a thousand reunions from this Miracle Messages app. Pretty crazy, right? Uh, we will definitely be linking to that and I will do some research because that sounds like an awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Wow. I found like my people just like, you know, I'm sad that I never thought about that app, but I'm so happy that somebody thought about that app. Mm -hmm. You know, absolutely. A lot of good people out there. You know, they just, you know, they just uh, need to be spotlighted a little bit. Absolutely. So that's what gives me joy. You know, we always go heavy with these questions, so I'm going to <laughs> lighten it up. But I appreciate it. that was that was beautiful. This is the perfect time to segue into our final line of question with our sure. Q and A. So, who is your biggest inspiration? Um, musically, from a singer, I would have to say that it's probably a tie between Luther Vandross and James Ingram. I really love those two guys. But then, I, but then, of course, I also love Brian McKnight and michael mcdonald so i have to put those four we need but, a playlist we need a playlist <laughs> yeah yeah so you can't you can't mention the titans of R. yeah <laughs> yeah i know I, yeah that, exactly that but you know um the funny thing about uh luther is that a, a lot of his favorite singers and where he got all his melodic runs from was you know was from females because he mm. said, because they have lighter voices, they they could do a little things a little bit more intricately, and that's why that's why he got into more of those smoother runs by listening to the ladies. And so, of course, I dissect Aguilera and Whitney and Mariah and you know uh, you know and, and everybody from Motown because they cut they paved the way, and you just keep on building, 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 and before you know it, you've got their repertoire. And, that, and but it's, since it's in your voice, it sounds original to you. So awesome. Maybe I'm doing something right with having most of my faves like Brandy. Brandy, the, yeah, yeah. Most of the people that I love are are women in the first place. So yeah, I one my, so one, one of my singers um, was on tour with Brandy as her backup singer for like four years. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, okay, so I always mess up these final line of questions, so I, I always have to repeat in my head the the name of the podcast, the title of a podcast that I created. Yeah. I created our motto. So who do you hope to uplift <laughs> with your work? And anybody that doesn't think that they can do it, and I don't mean singing, I mean anything. Mm. You know, and singing is just one avenue of, of your circle of your box. But if this is, if, if in this circle is where you live, but your dream is outside that circle, what are you going to do? How are you going to get there? You know, and so, and if you could do it with one thing, you could do it with all these other things. Now your circle is just that much bigger. You know, people take their eye off the prize, right? They think of their dreams as being like down this hallway, there is, there is a mountain of gold and everything that you have ever wanted in your whole life is in that hallway, is in that room. But then when they start walking down that room, that hallway, there's so many spider webs and cobwebs uh, that, that they focus on, that they're not focused on the prize. And there are no spiders, it's just, it's just things of your past that are just getting in your way. And then they detour without ever making it. Mm. You know what, before I get to the next question, I, I have done a little bit of reflecting on my own yeah. um, kind of as I've gone into my own like career milestones where I was like, okay, I'm finally getting to that closer to that place where I'm like, okay, 
we're, we're getting where we need to go. And I feel like a, a lot of deterrence for people is that the journey could be very disappointing. If you got your head down and you're just walking the path, as this looks very dark, it's very daunting, like you're never going to get there because yeah. there is some ambiguous thing that yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. like, we, there could change. There could be like, I actually don't want to go east. I want to yeah. go west now. Yeah. Uh, and you figure out all of these little turns and it's like, okay, if you focus on enjoying the path, yeah. like whatever's happening now, you might look up and you have made it past what there was and yeah. you're like okay we have this new thing to go after like just enjoy yeah. where you are right now yeah uh, so that yeah that's, that's right that's beautiful right yeah life is in the details of that of that journey not not that end game right mm -hmm. and so i mean a lot of people feel that you know they don't they don't stop and, and look around them you know, so I, I, when's the last time you did not drive and you just walked, you know, for like three miles to get whatever you needed and walk back, you pass up a lot of good things. Or when's the last time you took a bus, you know, taking a bus and riding with all those passengers and stuff like that, you, you see families and people that are doing it no matter what they might not be as fortunate you as you because you're not taking the bus. But when you, when you step on that bus, you meet a lot of good people and you get to listen to their journey. I have so many stories of bus riding in New York. There, yeah. And none of them will be on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> they are hilarious. I will tell you. Um, people watching is a, I mean, during the yeah. pan pandemic, we weren't able to do as much people right. watching uh, just by design, but like, yeah, there are so many stories just like being around other people and just experience, you know, just experiencing humanity. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, yeah. That's where it's at. Um, so how do you stay engaged with your motivation or, or in other words, what keeps you going? You know, I'm always reading new things, um, exploring, you know, trying to listen to as many new singers as possible, up and coming singers, right? Mm -hmm. And and I, I do get uh, a lot of emails uh, or or direct messages through Instagram or through my website or whatever, uh, just asking for like a little bit of tidbit advice on, Hey, here, here's my YouTube. What do you, what do you hear? What do you, you know, can you hear of uh, any sort of improvement on what I could do? And I'll, and I'll give them that little bits and pieces of advice, you know, because maybe they won't be able to afford me. Maybe they won't ever have access to a, a coach in their town, you know, the, but there's plenty of good um, coaches out there, but maybe they just don't know how to find them. So if I could impart a little bit of knowledge to little, you know, to people here and there, that that brings me a lot of joy, you know. But then, but non musically, um, just giving back, you know. To, they're, they're, your academy, right? Your academy tries to help people to show them that they're where they're at right now is not where you know is only one option. There's mm -hmm. an infinite amount of dimensions that they could be traveling to and that's what i want to show people you know you could just because you're singing with me or you're playing keyboards with me and stuff like that try expanding your universe somewhere else in in your life because it'll probably make your whole world better and somebody else's pastor i i can't stand you but i appreciate everything <laughs> that you have said and that's why um so what's next for you do you have any events coming up uh how can people get in contact if you don't have any of that we want to hear all of that so you know uh, i am me and my partner have the hollywood vocal studios in los angeles we closed down our location but she's reopening it um, another location in downtown los angeles because uh she's going to be opening up the Hollywood Vocal Studios Conservatory. And awesome. yeah, so she's going to be concentrating more on classes, you know, group classes and stuff like that, as well as our private teaching. So even though we both have the brand Hollywood Vocal Studios, you know, as our, and we've had her for like 15 years, she's going to branch off and do that. Uh, of course, I'll help her out whenever I can. But right now I'm in, I'm, I've been floating back between Los Angeles and Nashville. And so I'm on the verge of, uh, promoting Hollywood Vocal Studios Nashville, also known as Nashville Vocal Studios. So another subsidiary of that. So awesome. it's new. Yeah, it's new. It's a little bit scary because I am 
not from here. Uh, my whole network is in Los Angeles. All my, the majority of my work comes from studios and managers and agents, uh, you know, as well as people that just inquire through our website. But here it's just, since I don't have that direct line to these yeah. managers or agents, I'm the new guy. And so I, all I can do is go off my pedigree, you know, and my, and my um, resume. And so far it's been um, pretty good. I've been here for about seven or eight months and now it's starting to finally slowly roll into where I needed to go. So exciting. Awesome. Awesome. So how can people get in contact with you to, you know, send their artists or be the artists and yeah. set up some classes? Or... So if they ever, if they ever want to know a little bit more about me, they could go to in, um, hollywoodvocalcoach.com or if they want to, they want to know a little bit more about um, our studio, it's hollywoodvocalstudios.com. And you can also hit me up on a uh, direct message, me on Instagram at Hollywood Vocal Coach. Perfect. All right. Before I say anything else, was there anything that you want to share with the congregation? I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I love it. I just, I just really believe that if you just do one thing that is not out of your normal routine and make it part of your normal routine, and it could be something as easy as doing 25 pushups in the morning, you know, you may not see a difference, you know, in the, three days, but you're going to see a difference in three weeks. And if you, and the shaping of your life is just like that with anything else, physically, mentally, spiritually, try something and go for it. With that, there's nothing else to say. Thank you so much. <laughs> we Thank you, brother. Foundation. I appreciate you so much for joining us. Uh, yeah, this is <laughs> the Ash Academy's Inspire of Lift Engage podcast. I'm speechless. We just got to end the show right there. So thank you guys. <laughs> Take thank care. you. <laughs> Thanks, brother.